Good morning. Before we begin today, we take a moment to recognize that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of the Huichin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochene-speaking Ohlone people, and is of great importance to the Mawekma Ohlone tribe and other descendants. We recognize that UC Berkeley community benefits from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. It's vitally important to recognize the history of the land on which we stand and to recognize that the Mawekma Ohlone people are alive and flourishing in Berkeley and the Bay Area. Yes. So welcome to the 2024 Prittany and Homecoming Lecture to everyone here and everyone joining us online. The Brittany and Honor Society is the first collegiate women's honor society in the country, established by women undergrads in 1901, almost 20 years before they had the right to vote. Prittanians pledge faith, service, and loyalty to the University of California, and the early Prittanians took action on things like student health and housing and equal access for women. Among other things, this resulted in our first university infirmary, which became Cowell Hospital, which is now the Tang Center, where there's a Prittanian room, and just last night, we initiated 15 new Prittanians. So, yes. So the Prittanian Honor Society is going strong. Prittanian Alumni was established in 1945, and one of our most important programs is the Faculty Enrichment Award, which is a an unrestricted grant awarded to an outstanding woman tenure track professor every year for the last 38 years. We're very proud that Dr. Ray, our speaker today, won this award in 2006. And I'm very happy to report that, of course, she has tenure. Uh, she's still a Cal, and she's agreed to speak to us today. Dr. Ray is amazing. She's a professor at the Energy Resources Group, and she has her BA in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics from Oxford and her PhD in Applied Economics from Stanford. Her research interests are water and development, sanitation, and gender and development. And her projects focus on access to water and sanitation for the rural and urban poor. She and her students have worked in India, China, Turkey, Mexico, Nepal, Tanzania, and California's Central Valley. She also serves as advisor to United Nations agencies and is a commissioner on the Lancet Commission on Water, Sanitation, and Hygiene. When I first talked to Dr. Ray about this lecture, she first said she could talk about water. Its global importance is undisputed and much discussed. Or, she said, she could speak on something that though it's considered to be a human right, has also been called the last taboo because it's such a difficult subject to talk about and therefore is relatively unfamiliar for many of us. Dr. Ray expressed concern that this talk could be uncomfortable for you, our audience, but I pointed out that we're all Cal folks, we can take it. Also, it seems to me that Prittanian is the perfect organization to shine a light on such an important topic that no one wants to talk about. Today, we're all gonna learn something and it's gonna be relatable as well as interesting. So thank you all for being here and welcome Dr. Ray. Thank you very much, Lee, and thanks to the Prittanian. Thank you for being here with the audience and thanks to the people who are joining us online for this talk. So I'm calling this talk Liberty, Equality, and Safe Sanitation. And I want to say that I'll probably be speaking in a somewhat more direct way about sanitation and sanitation needs than is considered, strictly speaking, polite. But this politeness has not helped the cause of sanitation for all, which is what I will argue. And so I will ask you please to bear with me. So the first thing we want to talk about is what is safe sanitation? This is a big term. What do I mean? We're going to use the UNICEF World Health Organization definition of safe sanitation that says the use of sanitation facilities that remove human waste from human contact, so that's a good thing, that are not shared with other households. This part, I think, is a little myopic, and so I'm going to come to that. The excreta should be safely disposed of or treated or transported away through a sewer and treated off-site. This definition does not consider shared or public facilities to be safely managed. You can see it clearly says that are not shared with other households, right? But my view and my argument today is that is a myopic vision of safe sanitation, and it inadvertently not meaning any harm, obviously, but inadvertently, it hinders liberty, equality, and the right to the city. 
So let's just look at some numbers, safe sanitation access today. On the left hand, you'll see that these are uh, household data from UNICEF and the World Health Organization. The dark green part is safely managed sanitation, which is the highest rung. The top gold part is open defecation, which is really very undesirable for both health and dignity. So there's been a lot of progress in safe sanitation and in basic sanitation facilities, but there's still a little way to go. Uh, this particular graph hides rural urban inequalities. Rural areas are usually globally much less well served than the urban spaces. And on the right hand side, you'll see new data that the WHO and UNICEF have started to cover, which is sanitation in schools. Now schools, of course, have young people, a very vulnerable population, girls entering puberty, having to manage their menstruation. So schools are a very important site for safe sanitation. And so we've started to collect data on that now. And you can still see that there are schools with no safely managed sanitation facilities, but then we've already discounted that by definition because they can't be shared. Okay, so that's a problem. But so basic sanitation facilities, which is improved. And then there's a layer of schools still which have no facilities in the schools at all. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So the global situation is a little bit dire still, and I want to focus both on high income countries and low and middle income countries in this talk. Usually when I speak about sanitation and water, I focus on low and middle income countries, but I find that people in developed countries are sometimes too comfortable feeling like somehow we've solved all our problems here, so which is not strictly speaking the case. So I want to make this as global as possible in its, um, in its scope. So now, what date, this is the data on households and schools. What data do we have on public toilets? We don't have reliable data on public toilet or community toilet access from most countries, including the USA. Now the problem is if they're not considered improved sanitation and they don't count as shared sanitation, as uh, a safely managed sanitation, then the incentive to collect these data and even invest in these facilities is a little bit low. So the definitions actually matter because these definitions guide government financing and governments don't want to finance something that they don't get any credit for. So this is something we need to bear in mind, right? These definitions are not innocent. You know, they have consequences. And I also want to admit that data on public sanitation and community toilets are very hard to collect. On the other hand, as we know in academia, are we really able to value what we can't be bothered to measure? And that's a question that I would also like us to think about in the course of today's talk. Now, why am I wanting to focus on public toilets, particularly in the city space? Public toilets are essential because safe, affordable, and accessible sanitation by the human right definition of 2010 is a human right. By the United Nations definition of 2010 is a human right. Now, the thing is your human rights do not end when you leave home or, you're in, or you leave school. Human rights are human rights all the time. Wherever you work, rest, pray, play, shop, a human right is a human right by virtue, an in inalienable right of being human. So the human right to safe sanitation exists when we are out and about going about the business of living. And this is the photograph I took in an open air Tanzanian market earlier this year. All of these ladies need to go. Where are they going to go? They're not at home, they're not at school. Clearly, we don't want to say they don't have the human right to sanitation, okay? So my argument today, and I'm gonna say this in order, and then I'm gonna go into each of these points. My argument today is that public toilets, beyond household toilets and school toilets, are really essential for good health and hygiene. Public toilets are essential for human dignity and the right to the city. Public toilets are all too often neglected and trivialized. This neglect, I will argue, is rooted in history, culture, and very slowly changing gender norms. And this deep-rooted neglect holds back the liberty of mobility and the equality of all to the urban space. So that's my talk. Public toilets are necessary for health and disease control. When you are up and out and about and you don't have access to a public toilet, which is clean, then you have to hold back the urge to relieve yourself. Holding back the urge to relieve yourself or denying yourself drinking water or tea leads to bladder infections, 
kidney infections, and other diseases. Public toilets are also a place where we can practice hand washing, and hand washing is one of the best and most effective ways to prevent pathogenic disease transmission. Public toilets are also a place which are necessary to manage menstrual hygiene, because if you cannot manage menstrual hygiene and you cannot change your sanitary napkin when you need to, this leads to yeast infections, urinary tract infections, and possibly reproductive tract infections. You can avoid this problem by going into a Starbucks, but then you need $6 for a latte, which is not very useful if you're low income or unhoused. Public toilets are also necessary for mental health. Parents, who are mainly mothers, but thankfully not only mothers anymore, with young children are extremely stressed on a regular basis when the child needs to go and there is nowhere to go in safety and privacy. In my experience, there is a global magic number and it is 6.5. 6.5 is the number of minutes that after you leave the house, the child urgently needs to go. Whatever you have said, you should go, you should go. Yes, yes, I'm all right. Within six and a half minutes, mama. Okay, this is like a universal thing. All right. And it's very stressful, I am telling you. It is super stressful when that happens, right? Older people are shamed and stressed because they often have incontinence issues. Menstruators are shamed and stressed if they need to change and there's no way to go that is safe and clean because nobody wants to stain their clothes when they're in public. When you have to go, you have to go. Nature's call cannot wait. Not the short call, not the long call, not the monthly call. Nature's call cannot wait. Few modern cities, however, have clean, affordable, and accessible toilets for the public in enough quantity or quality. There are usually too few toilets for too many people. Many cities, even in high-income countries, are actually closing their public toilets down. Too many toilets are hard to access or they are unsafe and unclean to use. And when something becomes unsafe or unclean, the municipality tends to close the toilet as opposed to upgrade it or maintain it to make it more usable. And most public toilet facilities still serve more men than women. And I'm really not even discussing the additional challenges of the gender non-conforming or the unhoused. Those are like separate talks. And here's an example of the London Eye, the tallest and most well-known Ferris wheel in the world, which gets 3 million visitors annually. It has free toilets in the basement of the ticket office, but look at the number of toilets compared to the visitors, 11 unisex cubicles and six urinals, which is very, very inadequate for the number of visitors they routinely get. And this is just one example. So women, girls, my argument is that women, girls, non-conforming individuals and the unhoused are disproportionately affected by low public toilet provision. Now, why do I say that? One of the ways in which municipalities seek to serve all genders equally, actually mainly they think about men and women, the uh, gender non-conforming issue has arisen much more lately, but, so let's stay with men and women for now, knowing that that is only partial, Municipalities would often seek equity by uh, allocating equal floor space for men and women, maybe these days an all gender uh, separate to toilet, but equal floor space may seem like a kind of equity, but it actually serves more men than women because urinals need less floor space than cubicles do, right? Even equal numbers of fixtures or seats are unequal because women take on average twice the time that men do to use the facilities and even more if they happen to be menstruating. I'm gonna come back to the time factor in a minute. Many cities, but not the US fortunately, charge a fee per use. Many cities have shared facilities which are pay per use. And this also undermines gender equality because women tend to use the toilet more frequently than men do in the course of a single day. So why does this matter? It matters because men and women use and need toilet time and toilet space differently. So women and women identifying persons, one, urinate more frequently, especially if pregnant. This needs time and space. Two, usually are in charge of taking children to the toilet. That also needs time and space because you have to go, then the child has to stand there, and then you have to strip the child, and then the child has to go. 
Three, have to remove and manage more clothing for all toilet users. I mean, we, we cannot go standing up, right? So you have to remove your clothing in a manner that also takes time, right? Regardless of what your toilet use is. Change sanitary products and dispose of used products, which needs time and space and a bin. And they cannot urinate except in a private place because of the need of social modesty, even if the need is really urgent. So waiting becomes a natural condition of women's and girls' lives. This is the Amtrak station that we took a photograph of, right here in the good old US of A. You can see the ladies line, and you can see the men, just able to go in and out quickly. Does it matter? I want to argue that it matters. Little girls learn early to wait, quietly and modestly, just to exercise their human right to relieve themselves. So they are sitting, next to mother or aunt or whoever they've gone with, cross-legged, thighs held slightly tightly together so that they don't spring a leak. Right from the early days they know, okay, this is the condition of life. My brothers and cousins and uncles, they don't face this. Of course you can say waiting is a routine phenomenon. We wait in line for tickets, we wait for coffee, the theater, for a taxi at the airport, we wait for a baby to be born, we wait for our holidays, we wait at the dentist, we wait. Waiting is a routine aspect of social life. But waiting for the toilet is a gender unequal phenomenon because public toilets haven't adapted yet to the needs of different genders. Not their design, not their number, not their placement. Gender equal toilet access would actually equalize the wait time. And there are actually some cities which are ahead of the curve in which this is part of the debate on sanitation equity. Okay, now once you're in, you've waited, you're in, you're gonna find badly designed and badly maintained facilities in most cities. The door where I work, Giannini Hall, opens inward, bumping against the toilet seat the minute I open the door, right? It opens inwards, using up even more space in the tiny cubicles. Sanitary product bins, if there is one, is wedged between the toilet bowl and the wall, which makes it really hard to use and which makes it touch my knees while I'm using the facilities, which is kind of gross. There is no place to hang a shopping bag or a diaper bag. In the toilet that I use in Giannini Hall, that hook is broken and has been for 18 years. Cheap toilet paper that falls apart instantly. Very difficult for a menstruator. Broken locks, also the case in the toilet that I use, broken locks which are a privacy and a safety hazard. Now in Janini, it is not a safety hazard, but there are other places where it could well be a safety hazard, you know, especially for women. And offensive graffiti. These are all features of the standard public toilet in the standard high income city today. And all of these features show the low status of toilets and infrastructure planning and low respect for users who are using the facilities. The most important point I want to make today is this is not trivial. Very often you hear people thinking about toilets as a small matter, it's trivial. It's not trivial because no toilets or bad toilets are an affront to health, human dignity, safety, and equal rights to public spaces. The quality of everyday lives in everyday settings, and this is very important, the quality of everyday lives in everyday settings can be assessed by what people are able to do and what people are able to be, ordinary people are able to do and be. Universal services that allow them the dignity of bodily health when they're outside the home or school and bodily integrity, the freedom to move, the equality of citizenship are actually very important parts of governance, and the toilet is just one aspect of that very important part. Public and community toilets in this way are like street lighting, or paving, or city parks, but do they have similar status? No. Why? Why does it have such low status compared to parks or paving or city lighting? Why do we tolerate this? And now I want to move to the deeper part of my talk. There is a lot of shame and disgust 
surrounding toilet talks. I'll tell you a very quick personal episode. I started my profession working on water. And my mother, who herself was a professor of history, has always been a very staunch backer and supporter of all of my academic efforts. But when I told her that I'm going to branch out to working on sanitation, for the first time in her life, she said, don't do it, Isha. And I asked, why not? She said, beta, daughter, water is a beautiful thing. Sanitation is a smelly thing. The problem with mothers is they're always right. <laughs> Water is a beautiful thing, and sanitation is a smelly thing. And that there is a lot of shame and disgust around what we call toilet talk. We even use this term. What do you mean? That's toilet talk, right? Human elimination in most cities is a topic of shame and disgust. Children are taught what is disgusting from an early age, and they're also taught who is disgusting at an early age. Disgust embodies some kind of ideas of contamination and very unrealistic desires for purity beyond evolutionary usefulness. I believe there must have been some evolutionary usefulness because the smell of bad food and so on, you know, is something that tips you off as you shouldn't be doing this. That is true. But this has gone beyond evolutionary usefulness, the shame and disgust that embodies ideas of contamination and unrealistic desires for purity because elimination reveals how we are animals beneath our humanity and we do not actually feel comfortable facing this animality of our human natures. Things that ooze and are sticky and flow are considered gross and yet that is what human waste is, sticky, oozy, and flowy. This unspoken embarrassment makes for toilet talk, and this unspoken embarrassment and shame and disgust are actually playing a big part in making it okay for toilets to be a city planning afterthought. It is very hard to find clean and available city toilet in many city centers. You will see that they're underground or in inconvenient places public facilities, you know, somewhere around the corner there, right? Little money goes into maintenance, repair, and attendance. Therefore, toilets become unsafe, dark, unhealthy, and dangerous places. They become disgusting. But what is the cause and what is the effect is what I would like to ask. Women's bodies and women's bodily functions are historically even more shaming and taboo than men's or children's. This is a photograph I took outside a temple, one of, the leading, one of the leading Jain temples in India. You can see the English translation below. Pregnancy and breastfeeding cannot be openly talked about in many countries even today. I'm a great reader of historical Victorian novels. And the way they used to talk about pregnancy, they could not say pregnancy. They would say, Mrs. Foster is an interesting condition. Or they would say, they are expecting a happy event. They would never make it bodily. So-and-so is pregnant. So-and-so is expecting a child. That is too embodied for polite talk. Menstruation forever has been associated with female troubles, irrationality, impurity, mainly by male writers, or so-and-so is totally irrational. I think she's in flow. This is not actually an uncommon thought, and I don't think it's completely vanished even today. Women have historically been thought of as somehow extra embodied. It's a form of othering. And these legacies are actually continue to be reflected in the overwhelmingly male subcultures of sanitary professionals. So sanitary engineering has been a traditionally male profession, although it is not exclusively so anymore. More women are entering the field now, but they're entering a subculture, as all subcultures do, demand a kind of fitting in and a sort of socialization. 
So a few junior women engineers and architects would find it extremely difficult to dislodge established de designs, financing, and priorities, and bring up some unpleasant topic like the loop. Studies from Sub-Saharan Africa have in fact shown that women engineers even find it difficult to go onto construction sites, which is their job, because on the construction site, there is nowhere to go for them. So they refuse that position, and if you refuse to go on construction sites, you cannot be promoted. And here in the USA, the first toilet on the Senate floor to serve female senators was established in 1992. The first female senator was elected to the Senate in 1932 from Arkansas. In 1992, female senators got a toilet of their own. Up until then, they had to run downstairs and queue while the rest of the public, the bottom floor when the public visits. So shaming and trivializing attitudes, I argue, are barriers to making toilet access the center of feminist campaigns. Because when I'm reading this, I'm thinking, the senators couldn't protest? The senators can't protest? Who the heck is gonna protest, right? But shame and disgust around human waste, which is a societal phenomenon, has made open discussion about toilet design and toilet policy a real challenge. Campaigns for toilet equity and access are considered trivial. There are so many things to worry about. You've become some kind of a bathroom brigand, right? What's the problem? These have been, there have been historically public campaigns for more women's toilets in British times. In the US, that is the reason there are no paper use toilets in the US in public life, because at one time, historically, urinals were free to use because they were afraid the men would go here and there, as it were, and women had to pay. And that was abandoned. That's why the US does not have public paper use toilets, okay? Uh, so it's a good thing. But shaming and trivializing attitudes have undermined these efforts in many cases. Somehow, you know, a woman who is campaigning for the right to vote is seen very differently by society than a woman who is campaigning for the right to pee. But refusing toilet access, friends, is a tried and true form of social exclusion by class, up until the Second World War in this country by race, and still by gender. There is absolutely nothing trivial, I put it to you, about social exclusion. If it wasn't for deep embarrassment, why would we need all these euphemisms for toilet use? We can't even talk directly about this basic human need and right. We have to say things like spend a penny, powder my nose, need the little girl's room, smallest room in the house, I have to freshen up, the restroom, nobody rests in the restroom, the facilities, or my favorite, I'll be right back. Or people use consciously crude expressions as bathroom humor, right? Words that I actually cannot actually bring myself to say in public. Right? They use consciously crude, then they know it's funny. Okay. Quote, unquote, funny. How, I ask you, can we make public policies to serve bodily needs with dignity and integrity when we cannot even openly discuss them? It is not possible. These othering attitudes, and I'm coming to the end of my talk now, are inadvertently cemented in mainstream sanitation discourse. This is uh, the Sustainable Development Goal 6.2, Goal 6, Target 2. It's a sanitation target. And it says, end open defecation, great, and provide access to sanitation and hygiene, great. By 2030, achieve access to ad adequate and equitable sanitation and hygiene for all, and end open defecation, paying special attention to the needs of women and girls and those in vulnerable situations. This terminology is picked up in numerous documents and policy papers and academic papers. Unique sanitation needs of women, women's special needs, unique sanitation behaviors. The thing I want to ask you, friends, is why should the sanitation needs of half the human race be special? Why should they call for special attention? Men and women use the facilities differently, yes. Their bodies are different. The social expectations of those bodies are very different but there cannot be anything special or unique 
about half the human race. They cannot, right? The problem is past histories, cultures, norms, terminologies have a long shadow on the present. Sanitation services and definitions, what does it mean special attention? Special compared to what? Special compared to whom? Sanitation services and definitions are still unintentionally using the male body and sanitation users as normal. And female friendly toilet designs are not mainstreamed at all. And this is why we continue to use the language of special attention, special needs and unique needs. The reason I don't like it is these norms and terms make women who seek sanitation equity seem like supplicants. They're supplicants, we're asking for extra rather than rights holders. This has happened to me many, many times in Nepal, in India, in Tanzania. If I speak to utilities, I say, you know, there's no bin. Madam, now you want a bin? You're asking for too much extra. Extra compared to what? Naturally, utilities don't want extra demands made on their sanitation budgets, but it's only extra if we have normed the male body and the female body is the deviation. That is what makes this extra and special language so insidious. We have to see safe and equal public sanitation as the human right it really is. I want to make the case today that it is not a trivial or a small or a taboo matter. It is liberty because it allows for the free movement of free people. It embodies everyday liberty. It is equality because it supports all genders, all ages, all classes. It embodies everyday equality. And I want to stress the everyday part. I told you in 1992 about the US Senate. But here's the thing. Everyone understands that running for the Senate or running for Congress is a matter of gender equity. Everyone will understand that. But how many of us are actually going to run for the Senate? All of us know what it is to run for the toilet. Glamorous equality is from the Senate floor. Everyday equality is from the toilet seat. That is what I want to say. Liberty and equality are public concerns and they need public support and public investment. And I will leave you with the words of a South African activist whom I met in Nairobi earlier this year. She asked me what I worked on. I told her I worked on water and sanitation. And she said something that I will never forget. She said, you know, water is life, but sanitation is dignity. And what, after all, is the one without the other? Thank you for your attention. It didn't go on for the whole hour because I thought perhaps you had questions, maybe you'd have a conversation. Please, ma'am. Kathy. I see things structurally. So yes, it, there's a complete disregard for what is equal because a lot of times the society was built by men. So a lot of the infrastructure is, I understand that, I get it. We also need to pay attention. I was equally incensed because it would take so little money to fix this. So yes. this wouldn't have to be your topic of research that you have to try to spread the word. Because half of our tax dollars, over half now, is spent by the military. Mm -hmm. And we can not question endless wars. We don't question dropping bombs on countries we don't declare war on. But we can't even have a civilized discussion on sanitation for all. That, that kind of disgusts me. So I don't know what can, what, what can be done. Can we it's name names or something? It's a hard thing that you bring up because that's really going straight to the heart of national and international budgetary priorities. And I'm almost, that's almost beyond the scale of what I can think about or imagine. What would I do if I had the treasury, you know? I'm even just saying, even if you bring it down to just municipal budgets, even those are cash trapped, they have a lot going on but sanitation isn't in the picture, on the table, in an equal way 
as other municipal services are. You know? You would not take your child to a public playground if there was dog shit everywhere. But you will go into a toilet where there is, not by dogs, right? And you will quietly do your business and you will creep out feeling, oh my lord, I went to hell and back because I cannot believe that hell looks worse than this. And that can happen in San Francisco. You don't have to go to, you know, Nepal. It can happen right here. We are, accept we are complicit in accepting this shame, disgust, and silencing at the cost of the health, dignity, and human rights of our sisters. What can I say? Sir. Have you noticed, so I live in New York City, and there's a lot of beautiful public restrooms, bathrooms, toilets that are closed. Yeah. So has there been a change and an evolution historically? And also you see this trend to have like permanent public bathrooms closed and substituted with like porta potties. Mm -hmm. There's like a cheap solution. So I'm mm -hmm. just wondering, like a general trend, and mm -hmm. then, you know, beyond the issue of gender mm -hmm. equity, Mm -hmm. Is there a general trend, and how do you change a public conversation around that? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. I also have noticed a lot of closures. I think that the closures happen for two reasons. One is, if you make something and you leave it to be neglected and unattended, there is much more scope for what you might call antisocial activities like drug use or sexually predatory behavior or not bothering to clean up after you have sprayed everywhere. What, what is the incentive to treat something well? And then the whole thing goes downhill. And the, what the municipality does, rather than clean up its act, it closes it for financial reasons. Toilet closure doesn't lead to the same public outrage. And my feeling is it doesn't lead to public outrage because we don't like talking about this. This is the problem. We don't want to talk about it. And so how could we protest it openly, right? It's a problem for both men, for all genders. Nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to. I mean, look at what my mom said, don't work on this, Isha. Nobody wants to work on it, right? The porta potties part is a good point that I hadn't actually thought of. What are the implications of closing um, permanent fixtures, you would say, and putting in porta potties? I suppose if they are adequately maintained and enough in number where the population is the most dense, it may not necessarily be a bad thing. But have you noticed toilets in airports or train stations? They're very nice and clean in general. By the simple act of having one attendant who just replaces the toilet paper, washes down the floors if necessary, right? It's not a lot. We're not talking about some amazing technology. It's not a lot, it's an attitude, it's a mind shift that we have yet to make. And that is considered somehow gross to talk about in public. Are there any, any municipalities that have made that mindset shift? Are there any? Any municipalities or cities that have made that mindset shift? The mindset shift has not come in, but there are cities in the US, I read this in a nice, um, article a couple of years ago in The Atlantic that are actually thinking about weighting equity as a way to equalize the gender gap. And one good thing is a lot of sports stadiums have in the US have expanded women's toilets. At one time, they just thought that, okay, only men go to watch sports. This, of course, is not true. And there would be these huge queues outside women's uh, facilities, and that has apparently been closed in several cities, including Chicago. But I think it's getting there slowly. You know, I think sometimes about Martin Luther King Jr., and he says, you know, the, the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. And I think we have to believe in the justice, but we have to keep in mind the long. It's a slow process. Um, I was just curious, I know in the last couple of months, the Grants v. Johnson um, Supreme Court case falling apart, um, that makes it now like legal to um, criminalize someone based on their status condition. So like in the Bay Area, we've been using um, like unhoused populations um, as like the 
specific for that. I know in Santa Clara County, um, the water board has been using public defecation as their like reasoning to um, criminalize the unhoused people in that area. Um, yet I find it really interesting because Santa Clara County has almost no public toilets. And that's a big conversation happening in the South Bay. I'm curious what that looks like in the North Bay and if like Grants v. Johnson or if in general, like the, the water boards and stuff, if that's a, a problem up here with um, like criminalizing. I think public sanitation is a problem in all of the cities up here in the Bay Area, in the North Bay. Mm -hmm. um, they're not all gross or disgusting. I don't mean to say that, but too many of them are, and there are very, there are very inadequate numbers, even in highly populated and highly, you know, high footprint areas. And there are always the very long lines for women versus the men's facilities, because it's just, you know, that equal floor space, which still dominates or historically dominated uh, gender equal thinking is, is, is just a criterion that makes, that takes no account of the differences in use. My belief is very strong that we still think of the normal as the male. Historically, that has been the case in the profession. Historically, that has been the case. Truly, a hundred years ago, women who were out and about far away from their home weren't even considered decent. Of course, that is not the case now, but there is a legacy effect. There is a legacy effect. And so my belief is if you don't come out and confront it the way any other civil rights campaign has been confronted, we, we will make very slow progress on this matter. But it's a difficult topic. It's a very difficult topic. There is nothing clean or pretty about it. Um, I first want to say thank you so much for this. It is uh, so important and really I'm grateful for the talk and the illumination. Um, and I was wondering about the, the UN statement um, that, uh, that you talk about placing the, uh, you know, the, the male perspective right in the center. When I first looked at it, I thought, um, it, well, at least it uses the word defecation, right? Um, and um, I, I don't disagree with the uh, problems inherent in specialing um, women's issues. But I wondered if you knew or, or could inform us about some of the, um, some of the issues that arose in the crafting of that language mm -hmm. and whether there were issues, you know, using the word menstruation or something like yeah, that yeah. globally or, yeah. or uh, what was going on there. Why they did not say menstruation, I don't know. I don't know. But it did for sure by that time, the original development goals, the Millennium Development Goals in 2000, which is just a short time ago from 2015 when the SDGs were done, only spoke about defecation because it was considered a public health hazard. So in public health, we fear contagion and communicable diseases and infections more than we fear other illnesses and bodily diseases. So for example, psychosocial stress cannot be passed on, but pathogenic contact with hands can be passed on, right? So there's always that fear of contagion and infectious diseases that really dominated the public health sector. Who dominated the sanitation goal, okay? By the time the SDGs came around, there was a consideration that there were other uses of the toilet beyond defecation, especially there was a strong group of people, Archana Patka from Bombay, Marnie Summer from Colombia, who, and others who started writing about the need for menstrual hygiene management and the shame and um, social stigma that has accompanied it as a psychosocial health issue, you know, which it undoubtedly is. And so that was, had become part of the mainstream thinking I don't exactly know why they couldn't get themselves to say. This part I really don't know, other than, I mean, this special needs business, okay, on the one hand you can say it's like a, a delicate way of saying urination and menstruation. The problem with this delicacy is it specials them, that's what I'm trying to, that it makes it a deviation when it is not a deviation. 
and the dangers the whole municipalities have spoken to. They will not say it's a deviation, but how else do I interpret the term, this is too much, this is extra? How else can you interpret it? Means there's a norm, and that norm is not us. As a lifelong uh, sportswoman playing on various fields all over the Bay Area, uh, my women's rugby team uh, one day passed along the expression, if men menstruated, there would be a department of menstruation. Yes. I mean, this is And totally is that not possible. the truth? That is totally possible. Um, I mean, honestly, though, generally, human elimination is of any type is traditionally considered a shameful topic that you have to sort of dance around a little bit. And I'm not saying we should start, you know, openly. I mean, I have never gone to a friend's dinner party and what do you work on? I'm not going to say poop. No, I wouldn't do that. But if we're not a little bit able to think of it in a straightforward public health and human rights way, the way we do other public health and human rights, considerations, then our progress is going to be at snail space. A couple other observations. I'm sporting a badge uh, that supports the Measure X to um, continue to fund the Berkeley City Library. The libraries have become a place of public restrooms. Oh, that's nice. And the mm -hmm. librarians often deal with situations that are pretty uncomfortable for mm -hmm. them. Uh, that has seemed to be, at least if you're in the neighborhood of the Central Library, that's about the only public toilet in yeah. downtown Berkeley. That's, that's a good thing to know, and that's uh, obviously the libraries weren't built for that purpose, but they serve the public in broad ways. I, I do think, though, that for um, physically challenged people or for unhoused people, there are still some barriers to going into uh, even a public library. It can be a bit intimidating or difficult. And so, you know, I think that a toilet design that serves the female body is likely to be a toilet design that does a better job of serving everybody. Uh, lastly, the move to gender equal uh, bathrooms. I wondered if you might comment on that. Um, I'm going to places you mean where there's a separate it, it used to completely. be a men's room. Yeah, it used yeah. to be a women's so room. So now there's a separate gender neutral, all gender toilet, right? Well, no, the men's room has been all gender. The women's room, women's toilet is now all gender. Personally, I think that would be a, a problem for a lot of people with, let us say, traditional values or um, concerns about modesty, that if everybody can enter the men's toilet, if you're not a male identifying person, I think that's probably a bit of a barrier. I, I don't mind the separate cubicles for all genders because that gives you privacy. What I don't like is when one of the women's cubicles is con converted to the all gender one because the all gender one needs a seat. Can't just have a urinal. And so sometimes I find it comes at the expense of the number of seats available for women, and that is not great. But, yeah, what can I say? <laughs> okay. Okay, well, thank you again.